time is valuable and again may i just thank you all of you for your time today and for giving me the opportunity to share this it is a uh, very close to my heart and i'll explain that in a moment and thank you johan and rudolph for allowing me to, to be here presenting with your your, your clients My father-in-law was a pastor for um, 34 years, building a, a big church in, when I say big church, a massive uh, um, congregation over his lifespan. He put over a thousand people into church ministry um, over his course of his 34 years in, in, in church uh, life. But he operated out of the south of Johannesburg in a little place called Rosettenville and did amazing work for his life. But he picked up prostate cancer. His prostate cancer then, of course, went through the process of orthodoxy. Uh, his wife, uh, who fortunately um, for me has also passed, um, you know, and um, I'm not going to go there because I will probably be off for now explaining how grateful I am for that. But um, moving on, um, so he, he, she. She forced him into all of the chemotherapeutics, the radiation and the surgery, and that ultimately killed him. His death then caused my wife's MS to flare. Two, two months after his death, she was permanently in a wheelchair. Six years later, she died. So it killed two of my family members who were killed by prostate cancer, if you, if you understand. There was an underlying multiple sclerosis. So that with this historical background, I'm coming to share with you today what I've been spending probably the better part of a decade working on and this current thesis that I'm busy finalizing has been five years five and a half years in working on it because we have got to get to another way of saving this you see when you consider that that, that, that it is a killer of, a, of around about 20% of males worldwide one would think that there would be a priority to find a way to fix this did you agree with me if you've got 20% loss in your business are you going to are you going to look at it or are you going to just let it go you're going to immediately attend to it, correct? Nobody here is going to let 20% go. Now, when you're dealing with human life and 20% is falling by the wayside of the masculine portion, which is 50% of the, of, of the population, which is really 40% of, of the people that are being destroyed, it's a problem. Do you understand? So, so, of course, these are things that we need to go. Do, do you have your clicker? Then I can move on and not... You're the clicker. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Click away. All right. So I call this the most amazing organ, but completely misunderstood. You know that in most of the medical research today, they, 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 have, a, they have a disclaimer line, you know, there's not enough information. We don't have the clarity. This is not completely clear to us yet. How, and I'm saying, but are you, are you out of your mind? The, the main researchers that have been done in the medical world, the, the, the first really main one was in the late 19, uh, um, 1890s. Then we get one that happened in 1971, just a small few years later. 71 currently right then the next big one that, that happened was really in 2003 where is a big 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 research that has been done and i'm going to be dropping that on your understanding today because it's extremely exciting when you can see what that means so the prostate for those who don't know is that organ over there okay that little guy there it's normally about two and a half by two and a half centimeters should be very very small like a walnut very, very small. Doesn't need to be very big, but a phenomenal center of amazing things for the male. The orgasm, the, the, we'll come to it. So, if you could click, I'm under this. Unfortunately, this is going to be click, click, click. So, I know we're going to do right. So, one third of your ejaculation is actually prostate fluid. I don't know if you know that. These are just, I'm just explaining this. So, one third of your prostate is ejaculate, of, of your of your ejaculation is prostate fluid and this is quite important and the reason I'm putting this on here these are not in order by the way take note of this point I'm going to explain it later it's quite vital for 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 cleaning out the prostate later on okay if you've still got one and in your case I'm sorry to say you don't because uh, you know you've had to have it done the prostate gland is a function of mixing all the seminal fluids so it actually is a mixer in this process. It actually combines all the, the major fluids, there's five in total, but three main ones, and then pumps it out of the prostate. Thanks, uh, Rudolf. Uh, sure, sure. Yes, sir. Do you know what? I can stand right away. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry for the you No, please, let me get out the way. It's, it's quite good. Um, I just don't like standing so far behind a, a lectern. Um, all right, so it's partly muscle and partly glandular. And that helps to us to understand its function. And it's really called an essential muscle of the male body. We, it is one of our essentials, like the bicep, it's actually very, very important. And I, I don't know if you know this, but up to five meters of water pressure 
is what is produced in the prostate to push out the semen to actually ejaculate. Mm -hmm. Five meters water pressure, who's using that game? That's fairly high. In your dingle dongle, fascinating in that prostate. This little pump with these muscles, with these glands pushing out the prostate fluid, phenomenal. Okay, next one. The added benefit of the prostate's pumping action is to provide a great feeling inside and this sort of enhances the natural desire for sexual activity because one of the later points will explain why. So it actually enhances it and it is the male G-spot. Who knows that? Who doesn't know that? Ah, it is the male G-spot and almost in exactly the same position we find the male here, we find the female there. And it's exactly the same place anatomically you can find it very very quickly in the cavitations so it's actually very very good of course it enhances your, your, your sexual activity with not only a prolonged ejac um, uh, orgasm but also intensity thank you we can pop the next one now put that uh, picture on there please push the button again Ruth. okay the prostate gland is a type of filtration system and i uh, put that on there for a specific reason this cross section is there is a very important connection between these two points of the body through the prostate and a lot of this is un misunderstood and this is what I'm trying to, 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 to develop into a medical uh, uh, novelty that we can start finding a cure for the cancers. This is what we are looking for. This is what I'm seeking in the, in the background to find and, and that um, uh, section of the prostate is actually extremely interesting. So it's a filtration system so that it, it actually filters out the seminal ejaculate so that the quality of sperm is higher that you can increase impregnation. That's why it's actually it's a filtration system. And we didn't know that. I mean, I didn't know that. Did anybody know that? That's fantastic. Next one. You see, there's a lot of exciting <laughs> things. It actually can enhance erection. The prostate can actually enhance erection, strength, and power. Okay? Next one. This is for time. I'm gonna, I don't take too long. The secretion of prostatic fluid extends protection down the urethra. This is the most amazing thing. All the way down the urethra, when the prostate fluid starts to eliminate now you know this gentlemen that's probably i shouldn't be putting this on camera but um you know when you when you get a little bit of that fluid that comes out of an erect penis when you get excited it's quite viscous if anybody looked at it it's quite viscous don't answer because we say oh god fiddle yourself but when you have a look at that it's actually it's not urine it's not thick like custard but it's definitely got a bit of a, a viscosity to it and this viscosity uh, this viscous fluid that pushes through the urethra is there as a barrier to stop disease entering into the male body during intercourse how fascinating is that? I mean, we didn't know that, did we? Next, this is quite exciting. You know, you just think it's just a little doodah that it gives you a pain in the, in the rear at the end of the day and you have to cut it out. No, it's actually a very, very important function in the human anatomy. So this little prostate also controls with the two sphincters. That's why this picture's up. There's a sphincter at the top and the bottom, and they, they actually are valves. When we get that pressure to shoot, these valves stop the urine flowing into the ejaculate and uh, corrupting the sperm. It's one of the other reasons the prostate is in place to actually block and manage flow fluid flows because the urine flows right through the center of the prostate it's the urethra that's why we have problem when we start to find we have prostate problems the flow goes down because the prostate swells and the diameter of the urethra is crushed so it gets smaller we get pfft, and it starts to dribble we lose that flow like a horse syndrome it's and of course the um main function of the prostate is the conversion of testosterone into DHT and that of course is that really that sex drive that let's get going it's much more powerful uh, chemical than just normal testosterone so it is also a very important converting factor of hormones in our body interesting well these these at least fascinating so it's not just a useless item that's laid there it's actually called an essential muscle to the human male fascinating thank you mate So there is an overwhelming need for prostate health, and as we've heard from our dear friend, the, if you don't take care of it, there's an issue. There's always an issue if we don't take care of it. So how do we do that? What are we doing? And if you have any questions, throw them at me, but there is a Q&A at the end of time. Okay, right, this is important. The managing of cellular regrowth. There is a very delicate balance between cell growth and cell destruction in the body. And that's what apoptosis is and cell death. And this is meiosis, mitosis, cell regeneration and this balance in the prostate because remember it's all of our cells are constantly growing at different rates 
We know this. Your whole cellular structure is replaced every seven years. I don't know if you know that in your body. Just it gets weaker and weaker and the coding gets a bit short so they get gray and you get a bit wrinkled. And, but it's actually replacing every seven years. So any disruption to this mechanism, this, this cellular balance of growth and regrowth is actually leads us into a destructive state or an abnormal growth that can lead to a destructive state. So those uh, states will be changed by the endocrine environment, which is, could be easily hormonal as well as others, growth factors, intracellular proteins, pharmacological agents, and that could be including drugs, eh? illicit and, 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 uh, and uh, legal, well let's just leave that alone, pharmacological agents, micro elements, in particular the role of chronic prostatitis. Prostatitis is a big problem in, in males, and that's what our main issue is, is prostatitis, prostate infection in the development of a BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Thanks. So, who does it affect, really? Let's be honest. I mean, which part of the scale does it affect? So, although the benign prostatic hyperplasia really uh, um, causes symptoms before the age of 40, so that everybody is over 50, I gather, right? So, this is all of us in the room. 50% of us between the age of 50 and 60 are going to have an issue and 90% of people over the age of 80. 90%. And that's insane. Click the button again. But this I'm sure you didn't know that chronic prostatitis is also during pre uh, puberty visible. It's a, it can be as young as puberty. It, it presents of course as a voiding disorder. I can't urinate properly. And of course, that has a great impact on the life and the, phys uh, the psychology of the, of the young man, obviously. And uh, they have a, a severe, severe, not only voiding, but urinating issues. And then it becomes a whole pelvic floor issue. You know, pelvic floor holds your whole abdomen together. And all of these things actually go back to the psychology of the male. And I don't want to ask this, but I'm going to. How many of us have a psychological issue about our sex life? You understand? I mean, most of us, if we're going to be honest, if I'm not performing, am I performing well enough? Have I These things are, and it's, it's very closely tied to our character, our confidence, our masculinity. Do you understand? It actually almost defines it, if you look at it deeply enough. Right. So, next one. So, when we consider the prostate, and I put these pictures up because this is the prostate over here. It's really enlarged, but I want you to see the vascularity of, of uh, the, the, the organ, how much uh, uh, veins and, and, and nerves are actually attached to it. It's extremely important. So why considering the, the, the prostate as being so vital is that a lack of use, I'm going to use this repeatedly, or exercise leads to damage. So a lack of use of the prostate. How do you use the prostate? Yes. Wow. They don't buy a dumpling. You can sit in the front of the class. <laughs> You're ahead of the game. Okay. Sporting activities. Now, of course, vigorous sport, we'll come to that, is better. Riding a, motor, a, a bicycle can be detrimental. The constant hitting of that prostate can actually cause trouble. I don't know if you know that. Um, sexual activity decline. If your prostate is not working, your sexual activity goes for a bit of ball and chalk. You, you, you understand. And that, of course, hits our masculine confidence and it raises our confidence. Watch how men... Big men, big company men, a bit confident, shy when you get to a place like this. Have you noticed any wa wavering at all or not? Well, you, you're different to most. Well done. And then, of course, ultimately disease that leads to death. Because it does. So, consider the prostate if you find these of value. Why? What is important to us? Chronic prostatitis patients showed a significant decrease in libido, erectile function, ejaculation, orgasm frequency, self-confidence in sexual life, sexual satisfaction, the partner's orgasm frequency. The problem is if you've got a low libido, you're going to have no ejaculation. If you've got erectile function, you're not going to have any orgasm frequency. These seem to be interplayed with one another constantly in our sexual life, in our walk. And it's not one item leading this to that to this. All of these things are very, very interesting. And they start with a reduced libido on many occasions. And that can be caused by, well, I'm a prostate is sore, I'm in too much pain, all these sort of funny things. I've noticed a very interesting correlation when you mentioned diabetic medication. And I'm very pleased that you offered because I've noticed very quickly after getting a diabetic diagnosis, you find that you're hypertension. 
You know, you're hypertensive, so you've got to take hypertension medication. So you've got to take blood you know, pressure medicine. Blood pressure medicine attacks what part of the body first? Anybody know? Correct, the erection. Well done, that was fantastic. Right, so the chronic uh, uh, prostatitis symptoms will significantly decrease sexual function and of course your sexual life quality and overall quality of life is destroyed. It's actually very, very important that it's not just one aspect, it's this little organ this size that actually can knock us completely for a loop. You with me? Next slide, please, mate. So, I'd like to show you the pathway to disease. Disuse or misuse of the prostate leads to, you're going to just, you're going to, you're going to, I'm just going to point where you, organ atrophy. Now, this word atrophy in Afrikaans, I don't know what it is, so I can't even try and translate, but I'm going to try and explain. Have you ever seen anybody, who, a friend of yours, lands up in a wheelchair? Two months later, the size of the leg turns into one third of what it originally was. Well, that's atrophying. It's a wasting away, a destruction of the organ. So it leads to an organ atrophy. Both of these reduce to a blood flow. Both of them, if you push again, they, they, a blood flow reduction to the prostate. Now this can be caused by multiple different things. Injury, surgery, uh, uh, infection, bacterial, viral. We'll come to all of these things. And the funny thing here is actually spousal re revenge syndrome spasm. Now, I'm putting that in just because it was completely fascinating. Spousal revenge syndrome spasm. So this is actually done when the earth is being a bit naughty and it goes, you know, for takeouts instead of getting, you know, uh, uh, home-cooked meals. And uh, the, 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 the uh, um, mental anguish he goes through, he gets into a spasm because if she finds out, his world's going to be in trouble and it actually stops blood flow, stops penile function, and he can actually be in trouble. And it's actually a medical research. So most of what I'm telling you is medical research, by the way. I can prove this from a medical, medical studies. Um, all of the blood flow reduction creates immediately toxic deposit into the prostate. You actually, it's a filter of the system. And a lot of the toxins are actually kept in the prostate. We're going to come to that later. Pathogenesis. You're too fast. I'm not finished. Stop. Donkey, I'm stirring with you. But a pathogenesis is lots of bacteria, virus, fungus. There's a lot of things that go into the prostate that could create problems, as well as calcification. So whenever you don't move something, anybody ever heard of frozen, sh frozen shoulder syndrome? Okay. Everybody had something like that. You know, you hurt yourself and you keep it, and then suddenly that joint, start off, where did you come from? Because it's not, it's not moving because I'm fixed. It's this calcification that steps up even in the prostate, and the calcifications uh, go again. This all leads to an inflammatory response in the body, and specifically in the prostate, which then immediately takes us to a prostatitis. And that prostatitis again will lead back, if you push it again, into what is really a cycle of madness in the benign prostatic hyperplasia zone where BPH now you've got a prostatitis inflammation process these things run against each other and then ultimately this leads us to uh, disease cancer and now we've got to deal with it because that becomes stagnant. So the concept, in, uh, very simply to explain, is that we get, we, we, we get uh, uh, the prostate fluid that's slightly viscous it then gets a bit more sludgy, more like pouring uh, custard, like you get ultramel custard. And then it moves very quickly to like a jelly-like status and then fixed solid. And you actually feel that on the prostate as a solid mass and that's now cancer. So that's the way it goes and actually can be felt. And this is why the finger exam is actually quite important. You know, but, and sometimes it can be missed, but it's, generally it's very important. Thank you. This is a strange, interesting fact. Maternal protein malnutrition has a direct attack on the prostate's ability to survive long time, long term. Ma maternal protein malnutrition. Can you imagine this? Maternal uh, uh, nutrition, malnutrition of low protein diet is associated with increased incidence of metabolic disorders and decreased male fer fertility in adult life. So, I mean, you know, this is going to be raw, raw, raw for the vegetarians, but look what this does. The, 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 this uh, maternal protein malnutrition delays prostate development, growth and maturation until adulthood, probably as a result of low testosterone. Could be, it could be, they're just trying to figure that out. The higher incidence of cellular dysplasia and prostatitis suggests that this maternal pro, uh, the pro protein malnutrition increases prostate susceptibility to diseases with aging. So it depends on how your mother ate, 
50 odd years later for the for the younger ones here 50 60 years later we are now having an effect for what the mother ate when she was pregnant with us how insane is that that, that is insane a lot of these effects we don't know about because we're only just discovering them now as we go along this is another strange fact but i'm not going to go into too much uh, detail but but, but people with, with with chronic prostatitis or, or chronic pelvic pain syndrome have uh, exhibited lower heart rate variability parameters so there's a heart issue that's attached with this and i'm going to come back to this a bit later because i was going through this quickly with my son just to say son did i actually have did i make this in order because i've got to speak to gentlemen they're not idiots and i you know i must at least make sense and uh, he showed me something that is coming out of the natural world again that is very very un well not very unknown but it's not well known should i say and it's interesting that this in the, the, the chronic prostatitis syndrome has evidence of increased arterial stiffness and not where we need it. You understand? It's in, it's in, in, in the veins and not where we need the stiffness. And vascular endothelial dysfunction. I thought you'd get that one. I could draw pictures. You know, come on, guys. It was at least funny. You know, you don't laugh. Oh, never mind. This is the first mechanistic correlation that found the link between a higher incident of self-reported cardiac disease. So the prostate has a direct link to the heart. Now this is fascinating. This is extremely fascinating because heart problems developing from this inflammatory or disease response, self-reported, not, not diagnosed by doctors. That's interesting. That's interesting because your body is not an idiot, by the way. You know, my mind is, but my body knows what's going on. If I start to listen, it can actually start assisting me with, with many things. etiology of sexual dysfunction the association between chronic prostatitis and sexual dysfunction is well documented in the medical literature by the way sexual dysfunction with uh, uh, chronic prostatitis includes erectile dysfunction ejaculatory pain and premature ejaculation I'm going to show you a few pictures here prostatitis will create an erectile dysfunction erectile dysfunction because we are men we've got to carry on being men we've got to get in get onto the horse we want to jump onto the thing and because we haven't had it and now suddenly it arrives angel it's here let's go now we're not, you understand it's, it's either now or never bang the next thing is that it immediately jumps to a thing that's now suddenly premature ejaculation i haven't had sex for so long i'm so excited bang before i've got time to think it's done and this creates another issue that goes on in the brain and oftentimes it is associated with ejaculatory pain pain in the prostate pain post orgasm in the prostatic area this whole lower section there's a heaviness that runs on the back around the back down to the front here that, that, that seems like I'm as heavy like I'm carrying a weight this is prostate it's referring upwards and we think it's a, a lower back pain it's not oftentimes it's prostate when you do a DRE, we'll come back to that later, and you actually expel a, a couple of drops of the fluid. The, the weight here, that heaviness, lifts immediately. Gone. Within, within three minutes of the procedure, the weight is lifted. It's extremely rapid in the body. And, of course, all of them have a direct impact on our physiological, uh, psycho psychological man, psychological being. It has a direct impact on, on what we actually uh, um, think and believe. Now I'm coming to this, it's called the prostate stagnation hypothesis. This is the 2003 medical study I was talking about earlier on, and with Dr. Giles. Now he found out some phenomenal things with a massive, massive study. I think, I think in this study there was 12, 000, uh, 1,250 people in the one portion of the study that he did. And he was able to, to expound that uh, um, prostate cancer develops in those who have fewer ejaculations, especially in their 20s. So the decade, there are three decades that are very, very vital in this mix is your 20 through 30 and your 40 through 60. If your ejaculation frequency is high, your prostate cancer incidence is low. It's, a, it's, 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 it's insane. It's directly related. And I'm just going to put an addendum here. Do you mind if I just go left field? We find that there are three sexual cancers that develop. All three are related to sexuality and all three of them are preventable. One is cervical cancer. In young girls, they have early sexual activity, generally picking up HPV, human papillomavirus, and they stop at sort of 12, 13, 14, 15. They start, by that time, they're 25, 26, 27, cervical cancer. Breast cancer and prostate cancer, those two are related to frequency. If you have a higher frequency of sexual activity, 
you have a lower incidence of the cancer in both cases fascinating because they both work on a very similar method as you start to get aroused the prostate swells as a woman gets aroused the breast swells the nipple erect blood flow in blood flow out health in toxin out it's a washing event in the prostate there's a washing event that takes place we're going to come to that let me, let me not jump myself next one this is extremely interesting and, and this i thought was quite fan fascinating uh, um from from what something you said just mentioning the, the the pulpit the frequency of ejaculation is a product of libido and opportunity so if i can or i can't timing no timing can i can't i when i when these are all parts of the frequency of ejaculation the latter being strongly influenced by social mores so we have a problem as 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 men sexuality is something we never discuss the older you are in this room the less free you are to talk about sexuality by general standards okay did you notice that because the way we were taught your father would never have spoken to you about the birds and bees if he did it was really about a bird and a bee bang there's no explaining what a penis does how it erects why it erects what the there's none of that information how do you get involved with a woman what do you do they just don't talk about it because it's something that was absolutely taboo absolutely forbidden and totally restricted to us uh, from us as um young men for example it is conceivable that certain men with normal levels of sexual desire might have strong inhibitions to masturbation i don't want to go into masturbation but who did not understand have an issue with masturbation as a child from a, a, a social spiritual church basis who didn't one you didn't have a problem one two you three of you out of the rest of four of you out of the rest of us right you understand how many are affected by just that okay when you have a look for various reasons of course one of them is celibacy for religious reasons and of course that reduces the incidence of sexuality especially at that early age of 20 in the 20s do you understand and i'm not suggesting you go and have sex with multiple women before you marry i'm not suggesting that um in conclusion we consider that the present results of the concept uh, are consistent with the original observ observations of Steele. He was another researcher was done that the reduced ejaculatory output in otherwise normal males is associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. So the higher the frequency of sexual activity, the lower the incidence of cancer. The lower the incidence of sexual frequency, the higher the prevalence of cancer. It's over and over repeatable with all men over and over and over. Ad nauseum, gentlemen. So I'm getting to a point, I think. We'll get there shortly. Okay. This is now an interesting explanation, a follow-up of this uh, study that was done with 31,925 males. So it's a fairly large study over a period of uh, several years, as you can see. The scientists found that ejaculation, those who ejaculated 21 or more times a month had a 33% lower incidence of cancer than those who ejaculated four to seven times a month. So if your frequency a week is once a week, once to twice a week, you've got a chance that it's coming. When you get it slightly higher, when you get to, to your, 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 your three times a week, it seems to have a 50-50 sort of a split. When you get to five times a week, it sort of gives you about 70% protection a week. More than that is even better. How many of us are attaining those numbers? Moving quickly along. Before we don't, don't, don't click. <laughs> now, I'm serious. Now, I'm just showing you this. This is a cross-section cut of the prostate. It's an interesting shape, doesn't it? What does it look like? Heart. What is associated with a heart? If you look at it quickly and you have a look, what fruit does that remind you of or vegetable that does that remind you of? Just have a look quickly. Tomato. Mm. Yeah. Tomato lycopene, very, very good for prostate, by the way. That's why you must have tomato in your diet if you have an issue with prostate. Lycopene is very, very good for the prostate. Mm. Comes from the tomato. Did you know that? I like Gentlemen, my tomato. Yeah, well, you must have it. It, it. There are so many attachments that you can see a lot of the organs of the body, the fruit and the vegetable that looks like the organ of the body, like a carrot. If you cut it in a strip, it's around with a center ring, very much like the eye. They say that, uh, you know, very, very good for eyesight carrots. You know, have you heard that? Eyesight, I mean, who's ever seen a rabbit wearing glasses? <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots of fruits and vegetables that actually help specific organs. The avo, for example, for the womb. Okay. 
Next, uh, Rudy, if you don't mind. Thank you. So again, I've just covered this. Cycling is potentially problematic because of the impact that you would get of the seat on the, on the perineum and onto the prostate, okay? It's not very far apart. You must remember you put your finger in and you're actually touching the prostate through just a thin, thin layer of cells. You can actually palpate the entire prostate and find out if there are any abnormalities are very visible just with DRE. The exam, I'm, just, I'm jumping ahead of the game. Rigorous exercise is potentially very beneficial. If you're running more and exercising more, get your heart rate up, specifically with the movement of the legs, you're gonna keep that, that prostate moving and you're gonna keep it functional and fed with oxygen, all right? Simple stuff, I mean, you probably all know this already, but um, the need for regular prostate testing, and especially when necessary, the DRE. I'll come to that now. So, shattering as that is, the importance of self-diagnosis. If you push a button, it'll just operate by itself. So there are many things that you can start self-diagnosing with if you have an issue or think you have an issue. Here they are. Lower urinary tract uh, uh, um, symptoms. You've got your frequency, urgency, trouble starting a stream, weak or interrupted urine, dribbling at the end of, of, of the... Um, I mean, you had to put a, a, a thing on to stop the, the urination is leaking out without control. The, the sphincter was damaged. Uh, Non-emptying of the bladder, very, very important. We don't empty the bladder and it leaves behind. Calcification of the bladder develops as a result. Uh, urine retention, in, incontinence, and of course, different color or smell. You've got to watch for that as well. A blocked urethra and an overworked bladder. Your bladder just keeps pushing and tired and stretching and it's overworked and it gets tired. You can uh, have a look here. The other side, on the sexual side, more is a low libido, erectile weakness, partial or inconsistent function, uh, low ejaculation volume and satisfaction as a result, pain after ejaculation or even during urination, and then blood in the semen. Always, whenever you see blood in anything that you're putting out, it's always dangerous. If it's out of your, your, your number two, if it's out of number one, always have a look at it. But don't forget the testosterone's involvement. So if you don't have a good testosterone, you may have an issue. Don't misdiagnose your... I've got a prostate issue because I've got a low libido. Check your testosterone first. Just do a testosterone test. Okay, very important. What are the complications of a BPH? Acute urine retention, chronic or long-lasting urinary retention, blood in the urine. Again, any blood out of any orifice is not good, right? Even your nose, it's not good. Co constant or frequent U UTIs. Bladder damage, kidney damage, and bladder stones. If you look here at this picture, you know, there's lots of pain that can develop, but urinary damage because the urethra is very thin from the pressure that occurs inside. Remember, it's a muscular glandular organ, and the pressure that grows into that, and when it wants to work, it's going to start lots of pressure on the internal. As it expands, the outer capsule restricts any further expansion, and it starts to put the pressure internally. And that's why we have these internal constrictions of, of, the, of the fluids. And it creates major problems as we go along. But when it breaks out and it starts to grow in funny shapes, then we've got some things that are there. Right, so the, back to the DRE that stands for dreaded. The dreaded, lots of people, oh, as you said, you don't want your finger in where it shouldn't be because that's not a comfortable space to go. But actually, it's, it's, it's actually quite vital. And from the age of 40, you should be having one a year as a, just a standard operating procedure. All right? And if I asked who's done that for, for in the last, uh, you know, every year since 40, they're probably all compliant. Fantastic. So it's very really easy. <laughs> <laughs> a glove. I mean, can you see how simple we are? We are such strange things. You know, it's only going to kill us. But no, don't touch that end of my carcass. All right. So a gloved finger goes in. It slides in. The prostate is very, very easily palpatable. And, uh, it, it, you know, a little bit of, of discomfort for about 30 seconds. And then the job is done. It's really not a long exam. It's very quick, very easy, and very, very vital. One of the, one of the, the useful things you can see that that picture is pushing on the prostate, if there are expellable fluids, toxins, uh, you know, infection, it actually can be expelled and it dribbles down the prostate, can be collected in a, uh, down, the, down the, the penis, collected in a beaker and actually can be analyzed. And that analysis will immediately say to you, this is infected, this is not. And you can see it immediately in the, in the patient. And again, with that fluid coming out of the the penis and collecting into the, the receiver, you actually, you know, tidy up and get up, and that heaviness that's in that lower back just lifts. It's like, what? Are you joking? How could that be? I had this, I had this heavy, ponderous feel. Gone. Gone very, very quickly. It's quite fascinating, actually. 
All right. So um, if you can go to the next slide. I'm, I'm nearly done, gentlemen, so you can take a deep breath. You know, <sighs> finally. Another strange but not so fun fact is that smoking's association with prostate tumor uh, uh, growth is actually quite aggressive. And it actually can continue for 10 years post cessation of smoking. It can actually damage, still be creating greater growth in prostate. It's prostate. Look, there's the medical research. All of these things I put at the bottom here are all for the medical studies you can go and have a look at and actually go and read this out for yourself. Quite fascinating. 2019. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not. It's not old. Yeah. No. No. It's not. No, no, not old at all. So there are various different things that are found in the prostate: infections and diseases. And, and can I just stop and say I'm not really a fan of the COVID conspiracy? Is that fair enough? So I can just let's get that out there day one. So I understand I'm slightly opposed to this whole malarkey that went on called COVID, right? Um, because medically we didn't see what they were seeing. My colleague and I we treated 15,000 patients with COVID. 19 COVID and we lost six in the time now that's a hell of a lot of difference all right so when you see when you see the numbers that were supposed to be splashed on everybody but they actually supposedly found it but yet they can't isolate it but i put it down there because it is a medical medical thing and i don't want to i don't want to lose credibility by putting it there and not explaining it all right secondly the significance of chronic prostatitis uh, uh, in that study um in august we were, uh, 2010 the actual the novel, novel gamma retrovirus XMRV is akin to the HPV and is found in males to cause prostate cancer, HPV cervical cancer. It's actually found they found the actual virus that's attached to the growth of it as a viral. There's lots of bacterial possibilities. You see the role of anaerobic bacteria. That it means bacteria that, that, that um, don't have don't need oxygen to live. Um, Male accessory gland frequency, chronic microbacterial prostatitis, IBS can also be a part of it. And then, of course, bacterial prostatitis. Let's go and have a look at the next one. This is now calcifications of the prostate, and there's two medical re researchers that are done just showing prostate calcification like that. That's a picture of a calcification, but it's a, more of a drawing of the prostate. So, again, you've got your lovely heart shape, but this now becomes very, very problematic in the prostate, creating the damage constriction of the urethra etc etc thank you toxins and the toxic dump from the prostate i just want to share this with you that i found most of that on the screen in the prostate fluid i've actually developed one of the most exciting ones with the cocaine i actually was able to find positive result of cocaine in prostate fluid from a patient who this was now on the 11th the 9th of the 11th 9 11th 9th day of november okay um of the year and the last time he took cocaine was in the last week in january so the whole of the year to november i found positive result for cocaine i, I was actually looking for the for the the photograph to put it up for you to actually see it but i i, I didn't have the right uh, flash drives with me when i when i got home uh, late last night because i was putting that together last night and um i wanted to show you that i actually have the full the test actually on photograph from 2018. curry if you go to a good curry who likes a good curry? Anybody good curry? Hot dog, all in all, you know, very nice. It's actually found in the prostate, funny enough. Crazy enough curry. And the flu virus. Here's a funny fun fact, or not, not really fun fact. If we do a, a, a prostate, uh, you know, milking or a prostate, what we what we call it in, in the medical game is really quite invasive. It's like a jackhammer, pop, pop, pop on the prostate and sort of really spits out all the problem. It feels like that at least. But it's quite an aggressive feeling for about 30 seconds. Out comes the, 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 the prostatic fluid. And if you do not prevent, within 30 minutes, you will have the flu. It just drops straight back into the blood and you'll pick up the flu, symptoms of detox, headaches, sinuses, blah, blah, blah. It actually happens extremely quickly out of the prostate. So that's, that, that's fascinating. This is a practical experience that we've actually found. Uh, a colleague of mine, much older than me, a senior uh, um, a mentor, who taught this to me, standard. If you're going to do a, uh, an injection, I mean a, a, a prostate exam on a patient, he hits them with, a, with an antibiotic immediately. He doesn't even hesitate because he knows they'll be sick. You, know, you made me sick, doctor. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not good. Next slide, please, sir. So the deficiencies in the prostate, this is something. We know that zinc is important for the prostate. Anybody got white dots on their fingers, on their nail? Anybody got a white dot on your nail? Have a look at the white dots. Anybody got a little white dot that's present on the nail? You're deficient in zinc. Not calcium, zinc. Zinc deficiency, of course, is also an ex a reason for prostate problems. And by taking extra zinc, 
you can actually reverse a lot of the bacterial problems in the prostate by just taking extra zinc. Who knew that? Simple stuff, right guys? It's not heavy stuff to do. Next, if you don't mind. Right, so treatments to consider if you're in trouble. So th this is very important. Prostate massage with or without orgasm, very important to do. We're busy trying to develop methods of actually doing this treatment to prevent and to treat advanced cases of BPH or, or, or even prostate cancers. We can see if we can, depending on what's happening with it, which we'll explain shortly, with, with that prostate during the orgasmic response, we'll see if we can actually move it to actually move away from the prostate uh, cancerous stage and try and reverse back and pull back from the cancerous possible. Is it possible? Let's have a look. Understanding the need for ejaculation is very important. The more you ejaculate, the greater the removal of toxins from the body. We'll see that now. Your diet is vital. You change your diet to get rid of the, the, the diabetes. Diet is vital. Exercise, very important. So this diet and exercise, lifestyle change is important. You're going to have to look at eating more healthily. And what is more healthily? That's a good question. We'll cover that if you want to. In the questions, you're welcome to ask. I'm going to say this is going to sound totally insane. How about a fatty red meat diet three times a day? Okay? Fine. Moving on. It's amazing how that works. Now, uh, now this is important, and I'm not going to mention your name, but I'm going to say this is going to even help you, okay? Because this is important to have a look at. There are three locations for male orgasm. I don't know if you know, there are three places on the male that you can orgasm. I mean, you know this, so I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know how many of you know it. And in the female, there are also three. If you know where they are, she doesn't know where she's, where she's coming or going, and I excuse the phrase. So, now, let me have a look. Push the first button. Obviously, the... Um, the male, the head of the penis, is extremely sensitive, and you can use just the head of the penis to orgasm. All right? The next point is actually on the frenulum, that little piece of skin, that funny-shaped frenulum. You've got several frenuli on our body. In the top and the bottom of our lip, for example, and our tongue has got a frenulum. Did you know that? Okay, it's a midline. It's a midline item, and that's a midline item that actually, if you watch, goes all the way down the midline through, through the, the, the testicles right around to the anus. And then the last is the prostate itself. You can get an orgasm with the prostate without getting, without touching this portion of your anatomy, you can have a, you can have a full orgasm. And some of those orgasms are actually quite intense. Some people who have skilled themselves up, which I haven't yet got uh, to, um, they're actually able to have 12 uh, orgasmic re responses in 15 minutes. They can last for anything from 10, 15, 20 seconds to 40, 42, 45, 60 seconds. Some with without ejaculation, the, the prostate sometimes is so strong it actually it explodes. For those who are married, the, the woman's uh, vaginal cavity when she is in orgasm cycles at about eight cycles. The prostate pulses at around about eight cycles. And that's why when you, you she can start, she can actually lead you straight into an orgasmic response because the cycle is exactly the same and the frequency talks to one another and it, it actually can happen quite often that you do that together. So prevention is always better than a cure. So why ejaculation and why am I focusing on ejaculation? Because in my mind, it's a natural method of curing disease. I'm not putting in a medicine to reverse it. I'm just naturally cleaning the body, naturally trying to do something. And it says here, if we go back to the prostate stagnation hypothesis, men who ejaculate more frequently are less likely to have prostate cancer. If that's the opening gambit, men who ejaculate more frequently are less likely to have prostate cancer, I must tell you, it is a horrible way to try and prevent disease. I can't see anybody here enjoying that. You, you understand? I mean, hello. Moving on. So, in short, carcinogenic secretions accumulate in the prostate. There's a lots of powerful substances and chemicals in the prostate and, and the, the prostatic fluid, the seminal vesicles, the Cowper's gland, the, the bulbous, uh, bulbar cavernous glands, and of course the, the testicles from the, the, the sperm themselves. And if these things are not cleared out frequently, prostate cancer can develop. E ejaculation eliminates these carcinogens regularly, right? Thus, the more frequent the occurrence of ejaculation, the fewer carcinogens remain to create disease, cancer. More frequent ejaculation, the absence of risky sexual behavior. Well, obviously, if you're sleeping with 17 people, you could pick up at least one disease, you know what I mean, at the same time. Um, you could present a, a very, very profound way of actually reversing uh, this risk. 
and lowering the great medical costs and physical and psychological impact side effects that are required to go through the process. It was not something pleasant that you had to go through, I could imagine. Not at all. And the psychological effects of that must be enormous. And I mean, I, I just say, well done. For you to be able to stand up here and to speak like that carries a phenomenal. Well done. I must say, it was a very, very well done. For you to be able to speak like this after something, something so horrendous. Congratulations. And just in final, part of what I'm busy studying, and this part of the thesis I've mentioned earlier, is this prostatic rhythm in ejaculation. The use of combination. We know that it works. So there is a build-up to an ejaculation and then a waning away of the presence of the frequencies and the, and, and the, 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 the movements as you go into a flaccid state or into, in, into a reflux. Uh, not reflux, what do you call it? The rest period. Then you go back into looking at this area a little bit closer. We find that there's spasm, 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 bap, bap, poof, and then doof, 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 doof. They come and then they ease out again. And it's in between these spasm events that we want to see what the blood flow does between them. Blood in, blood out. Does it have any effect? Is the muscle allowing the blood to flow? Is it adding the pressure? And if we can find that, we're going to be able to see how the blood interacts with the prostate gland for the removal of toxins. One of the most important things in the removal of toxin, for example, is, you're not going to believe me, but oxygen. Oxygen converts it and gets it to move, number one. Number two, oxygen, in its, in its active format, actually destroys bacteria, virus, fungus, specifically the anaerobes. And if you don't have blood in the place, you're not going to get the oxygen to deliver. If you're not delivering the oxygen, you're just leaving everything there. Also, it can convert the calcium. Calcium oxide. It's the changes its format and it gets out, you see. So this is what we're trying to do. This is what we're busy researching, and that's how I got to be chatting with Johan. And Johan then gave me this great opportunity to chat with you and uh, so on. So if we can have a look here. Now this is something, again, I mentioned my, my, my slight aversion to the COVID lock. Um, COVID vaccination and prostate damage, the one thing we have found in people who are vaccinated is that they are sterile. Most men are sterile. Sperm are dead. And this I'm seeing in young men, 23, 28 young men, young men, young men. Okay. To the non-uniform growth of the prostate. So I've got prostate, this actually comes down as a heart here like you can see there. That's just very large, different nodules damage to where it's really, really odd. So non-uniform growth of the prostate and of course elevated prostate cancer pre uh, presentation post-COVID vaccine. One of the biggest things in, that we have noticed medically across the board is that prostate cancer has jumped in the thousands of percent. I think it's over 4,000 percent elevation in prostate cancer pre presentation post-vaccination. Okay, that's high, gentlemen. That's high. It seems to be very, very close. The, 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 the incidence, by the way, of uh, abortion, uh, not abortion, um, miscarriage in girls, young girls, has, has gone up by 9,000% post-vaccination. 9,000. That is massive, gentlemen. You've got to agree with me. This, this is not normal stuff. Okay. So I want to show you something, if I may. Um, these are some of the strange growths. So hold on a minute, uh, Rudy. I want to show. This is a bladder, and here's the prostate growing over here. And there's the bladder in a different aspect, and there's the prostate. Look at this. Can you see it? Mm. Push the button, Rudy. You'll see now. I've just outlined them with a bit of a... Can you see that funny, odd shape that's growing in the prostate? The, the, these are odd things. Now, we do see strange things, but I've watched prostates that grow normal size. They buff a big thing up here, and then all the way up to the top of the... You cannot believe this stuff. I just didn't photograph it. I just did this last week because I did, I'm coming here. Yeah, I should have taken these photographs so I can show you what I'm trying to describe, you know, in physical terms. So these are strange sort of odd growths. I mean, that little finger growing out of that prostate is just, I mean, come on. Where do you see that? Now, anti-vax protocol. So I've got lots of patients that come to me with serious cancers that are now in a cancerous state post-vaccination. And they now want to know, what do we do? How do we fix whatever? This gentleman that came to me, I'm going to give this to you. This is going to be extremely exciting. He came to me and he was supposed to be having his surgery. Either it's yesterday, the day before, or it's Tuesday. He was supposed to have his surgery now. Okay, so I'm just explaining how, how close on this, this, this really was. So what happened to me, if you don't, one at a time, if you don't mind. So this, if you have a look at the date, it's the 28th of February this year. He had a cancer count of 11.3. That's fairly high. Okay. 
And then they took him and did another analysis. And this is by the, uh, the 5th of, of, of June, and that's 15.1. That's fairly high, right? Then they then, on the, on the 14th, I think it was the 14th, can you see that, oh, you did that, right, the 14th of June, they did this analysis, you push the button again, I'm just going to highlight the bottom portion here of, the, of, of the, the result, which it tells us in specimen one on the left fold of the prostate, chronic active prostatitis, a background atrophy and basal hyperplasia, and in the second, uh, on the right, the second uh, biopsy that they tested, invasive prostate adenocarcinoma. So we are dealing with a prostate cancer of the patient post-vaccination, and this is as, as early, it was about the 14th of June. He came to me a couple of weeks later. I've only, by the time I've got the last result, I've only treated him for six weeks. Okay, so if you could push the button. He then went after three weeks, we got a 6.7. Can you see that? I've actually got these results on my computer. You can see 6.7, and then we push the button again, and this was now on the... Uh, you can see the date, the 7th of the 9th, that is a 2.9. So he's down to a 2.9. What treatment did you give him? I only gave him the treatment that I have developed to reverse the vaccination for COVID, nothing else. I didn't treat cancer, I didn't treat prostate, I just treated vaccination in this case. Because, you see, when you see a development of a condition that's come as a result of a medical intervention, and you treat the medical intervention and the condition goes away, was the condition related to a cancer or was it related to the, con the medical intervention? And that's, that's where I've, what I've done, you see. So it's, it's extremely, r risk is not the word, but you, you understand you've got to balance, balance, balance. That's why frequent testing was important. There was three weeks and six weeks. And, and by that stage, at, at 2.9, I also did a CEA here, and I wish you could see it. It's actually 5.04. And a normal CEA is 0 to 5.00. So it's 0.4 away from being in the normal CEA. And as you know, CEA is spreading of cancer. So he's already just about back into normal. I threw that in. I should have done it earlier. I threw it in because I want to say, okay, well, where's the next phase of our treatment going? So I think we're going to have another test coming now this week. And I want to see exactly where the CEA is and where we're going. In fact, I sent him a message and I said to him, and again, all of these, these blocks, I've cut out his name because I'm, you know, I'm not putting him out on public. But you can check all of this. I've got the research. Uh, I, want, I want his prostate count to go to 0 0.00. That's where I'll be comfortable. Okay. 0 0.04 is fantastic. You can live there quite comfortably. So this was quite a successful event that we just, just had. It's recent. He should have now been either cut or going to be cut uh, next week early. And he has been totally spared from prostate surgery. And that, for me, as far as I'm concerned, is a win for him. His life is slow, and he's a young man. He's only 62. So we're not going to, you know, cut that out. I mean, for the next, how long of his life he's got it? No. Right. So and I think there we are. Can you push the button, please, sir? Um, I know. There we go. Q&A. If there is any Q&A, probably not, because we're probably bored to tears. And, uh, you know, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. And if not, we can end this and go on to the next thing. So. Is it important that the jacket actually leaves the body? Or is it because in t in I've done tantric training, we actually retain, retain the jacket? Is there an issue with that? Retrograde, retrograde um, uh, orgasm, or, uh, ejaculation, goes into the bladder by definition. That, that's where it goes normally. And you can actually see it coming out of the, the bladder later on in the urine. So you actually find it in the urine later on. It retrograde, it goes back up into the prostate. It's called retrograde ejaculation. And I found that when you actually... Um, uh, have a normal ejaculation after several years. I had a, I had a patient who had an ability to do um, a non-ejaculatory orgasm, any other, non-ejaculatory orgasm. and did it for several years. And I said, hold on, this is not healthy for the prostate. Just dump the, the you know, get it out for a reason. I, so I sent him to go and literally go and, you know, get it done when he gets home. He phoned me about half an hour after what I would have thought would have been his um, normal distance to travel. Because I think it was only been an hour or an hour and a bit since you, you were here with me. And he was sounding like he was dying. 
I said, what has happened to you? I mean, I saw you not an hour ago, and he was snotty, he was coughing, he was, he was spluttering and wheezing. And I, I said, what's it? He said, I've got the flu, my neck, my head. And literally in three weeks, I took to try and recover him from that. And that was probably about eight or nine years ago. Could be longer. Could be longer. And in fact, it is longer. It's probably about 12 years ago or so I did that with that patient, which is huge. And so there's often times if that expulsion doesn't happen, you're retaining a lot of it, and ultimately you can actually have a problem. But it is visible in the urine. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm fine with, with, with you doing that, but not permanently. Not only. You must get rid of it, okay, from the body. But then, of course, you haven't done it for years, you know. Made lemon, vitamin C, honey, ginger, garlic, you know what I mean? Have it waiting, because it'll come. It'll definitely grab you before you know what's happening. Anybody else? So I was um, sick after the um, vaccination with COVID. Okay. On a regular basis. basis. I don't know whether it was with inoculations or whatever, but um, but now I'm fine. I don't get sick. Well, I didn't get actually sick before the time, and I I'm not now. sick then. Mm. Was it maybe that it came out? via ejaculations, you don't know that. Well, we don't know, no, you check the blood for that. Put that under microscope, have a look and you'll see very quickly. Check your blood. I donate blood and okay. every time I donate blood, I feel better. Yes. yes. Because I get rid of that. <laughs> Give it to someone else. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Moving quickly along. I mean, whose side is he on? We're not even going to mention that. <laughs> Crying in a bucket. Right, so you work for the enemy then. So. Yeah. Okay, we, we're right. Mark him, he's red and green. Okay, <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Anybody else, anything else? So, uh, first, thanks for your presentation and the overload of information. Overload? Um, and for your honor of organizing it. Uh, you talked about prostate uh, massage. Mm. Is that something somebody should do who is medically trained for that? Um, this is a fantastic question. Um, this is part and parcel of the work that we are busy trying to establish because a doctor doesn't have time for that. Mm. Okay. It needs to be done by a practitioner who knows what they're doing, that knows the anatomy and knows what's going on with a practitioner. I don't mean a medical, I mean a practitioner, somebody who's, who deals with this. So yes, it needs to be done. Look, theoretically, theoretically, anybody can do it if you just know what you're doing and you know the pressure. If you go too hard, you can create blood bleeding damage if you're going too soft you're not getting enough you've got to get the right parameters you've got to work the right way but no it's it's actually something very very simple but now to specifically use it for a treatment for cancer absolutely we need somebody qualified you understand mm -hmm. for general protection you know your wife your partner anybody can do the job it can easily be done without too much uh, ado but for for medical ado no no we need to have we have to go that little bit extra because we've got to be extra cautious all right so, you know, responsibility requires better pre 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 preparation and planning and put the right people in place that are skilled to do the job. Yeah. But no, it should, be, it, it should be something that anybody should theoretically be able to learn and do, theoretically. Given to understand that there is a um, physiotherapist practice in Victoria that actually will oblige really? in that regard. But well, if you could please let me know who that is, I'd be, I'd be most grateful because I'd like to understand that. Very, very interesting. Anybody else? Are we done? Am I released? No, thank you. It was very thank nice you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Johan, thank you. Back over to you.